Hello. In this video, we're going to construct what's called the Buckley Leverett solution. And this is a solution to describe the evolution saturation when we have two phase incompressible flow in a porous medium in one dimension. In previous videos, I sort of set the solution up. What I'm going to do now is to go through how you find that solution and what that means physically. We'll go straight to the whiteboard here. Okay, so I've already um, written some things in place so that uh, we can sort of get ourselves started because this is review material. So we're going to find the water saturation here. Okay, and the water saturation is a function we're going to assume of a dimensionless velocity. And this is a ratio of a dimensionless distance to a dimensionless time and the dimensionless distance is the distance from the injection well at x equals zero xd equals zero and a production well at xd equals one td is the pore volumes of water injected so it's dimensionless time but it's represented in terms of volume it's how much water we put in the system um, relative to the total pore volume so now the boundary conditions are at the injection well. So this is xd equals zero, so it's vd equals zero. The water saturation is its maximum. That's where we're putting in the water. So that's, it's not one, it's one minus s of r because there's a residual saturation. Okay. Then at td equals zero, which actually means vd tending to infinity, so a long way from the injection well, um, we have the initial water saturation. So SW is the initial water saturation. And we will assume in this analysis that the water is there immobile. So the only thing that's flowing is the oil. Okay, so at the injection well, the only thing that's flowing is the water. A long way away from the injection well, the only thing that's flowing is oil. And there will be a change in saturation um, in between. And we assume that's just a function of velocity, it's just a saturation moves at a specific speed. Okay. And we've, we've gone through this. I'm not writing down the partial differential equation that we've solved. It's in the previous videos, but actually it turned out that a partial differential equation didn't work in all the cases because we had a shock. So it's essentially conservation of mass. So if you conserve mass, a solution that makes sense can either be a constant saturation. So you can have any saturation that's constant. Then you've got oil and water flowing. That's a solution to the equation. And trivial though it appears, it is a solution. So don't lose it. The possibly the most interesting is the rarefaction. It's where there's a smooth change in velocity with saturation and the velocity is df ds. And F is the fractional flow um, and it's a function of saturation. And the third type of solution is a shock, okay? Um, which is a discontinuity, a sharp change. And so in order to illustrate this, what we're gonna do is a constant state will illustrate in red a flat line because the saturation is constant. Um, the smooth change okay, is a smooth change like this, which we'll show in blue, and the shock is a sharp discontinuity, so a discontinuity in saturation. Okay, now you might wonder, well, what's, um, what have we done here? I've drawn a couple of axes, so what I'm going to do is we, it's clearly got something to do with the fractional flow, so let's plot the fractional flow here. This is its maximum value that is one, where you have just Water flow. If we have gravity, it can go greater than one. I'm going to show cases where we've ignored gravity, but actually exactly the same uh, methods and analysis and equations obtain um, if gravity is included. So it's not necessarily a special case, it's just one easy case to sort of get ourselves started. Okay, so I'm going to now, on this axis, I'm going to plot saturation. This will be the initial water saturation, okay. and this will have will be fractional flow of zero. And this is one minus SOR. So it's the maximum value of saturation that we get to. And I can in this graph then show uh, where we're at that point, FW is one. So we've shown the fractional flow curve um, in previous videos. Uh, the water fractional flow starts off low. Okay. It then rises steeply and then um, it decreases. Okay. So that's my fractional flow. And what I want to do is I want to use this fractional flow function to find a solution for my water saturation, which I'm going to show here. 
and this again will be by maximum value, one minus SOR. This will be zero. This will be my minimum value, SWI. And this will be written as a function of BD. Okay, and this will be zero. Okay, and we know that we're a long way out here. We have our constant state, right? Which will be our initial. So that's supposed to be a horizontal line there. Not, not terribly well drawn, but that's what it is. Okay, so how do we, what I'm gonna do in an engineering sense rather than a mathematical sense, we've got the equations here. This is, this seems to be done graphically and indeed it will be done graphically. And that sometimes makes people think it's oh, the gross, I wanna write lots of algebra down. Um, it's still correct, okay? Um, so the first thing you do is you can see here in the rarefaction that VD is DF by DS. So we know what to do here. Um, we calculate the gradient. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to calculate the gradient of this curve at one minus SOR. And we're going to call that gradient VD min. It's going to be the minimum velocity and it's DF by DS at one minus SOR. Okay. So we can put this on this graph here. Okay, now, VD min for many relative permeabilities, and one might say even most relative permeabilities that you see experimentally, is zero. Actually, this curve comes in at a zero slope. Now, if you know the relative permeabilities, we've in previous videos shown how to calculate the fractional flow from relative permeabilities, you know the fractional flow. So you can do this analytically, you could do it from plotting it, um, you can do it sort of almost by eye. In this case, just to make it more general, we will let VD min be a finite number, but it may be zero, in which case we start here, and that's, that's fine. So now what do we do? Well, we can have a constant state, one minus SOR, from here to VD min. That's perfectly legitimate, we just said, constant saturation in the problem. Then, as we go down this curve, the gradient will increase. It's a bit uh, bumpy, but it's supposed to be a smooth curve. So you can see that the, the gradient will increase so VD increases as saturation decreases. So I can draw, therefore, okay, a rarefaction that looks like that. The problem with this is that we know that the velocity increases, 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 reaches a very high value, and then goes back down to zero. And that doesn't make any sense. That's not a you know, physically sensible solution. So we know that there has to be a shock. We know that there has to be a shock. We've already talked about it. So how do we find the shock? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you how we find the shock, okay? and then I'm going to sort of justify and explain it. So what you do is, with a ruler, if you've got a graph, okay, you start at SWI here, FW equals zero, and you draw what's called a tangent to this curve. Okay? And it's not the, the best curve in the world. Okay, That's maybe better. Right, like that. Oops, sorry. There we are. Okay, so let's assume, and I don't want to you know, make too much of it, let's assume that on a smooth curve, the tangent is here. That's actually the shock. And the, the fractional flow curve maybe is sort of a little bit smoother underneath here like, like that. Okay, so this is the tangent. So it's where the curve, where this line is tangent to the curve. On the other way, this, this gradient is actually gonna be smaller. It's very close to the curve, but it's not. It's got a smaller gradient, and here it's got a higher gradient, okay? So we're gonna call this point, okay? And we can do this in green because we're looking at the shock. This will be the fractional flow to the left-hand side of the shock, and this will be the corresponding saturation at the left-hand side of the shock. So on this diagram, this value here, is SW left. The right hand side of the shock is SW I, is SW right, and the fractional flow is zero. So the fractional flow on the right hand side of the shock is zero. Okay. So what's the speed of the shock? The speed is the change in F divided by the change in F, S. So VD is of the shock is FW left, as FW right is zero over SW left minus SWR, and this can be fine. It's a unique point on a smooth curve. So if you have a point, you do a ruler, it's not as clear as maybe it should be here, um, there is a tangent, okay? It's where it just hits it. 
And what it means is that at this point, the slope of the line is also equal to df ds. Okay. So that means that the rarefaction speed here is equal to the shock speed. And that's, that's quite important. Okay, that's the definition of what you mean by tangent. And then we extend it. So this is a solution. This is, this is the, the Buckley-Leverett solution. And it's, it's, it solves the equations, right? It has two constant states. That's okay. It has a rarefaction where V is df ds. That's okay. And then it has this shock where the shock speed is equal to the rarefaction speed here, and it shocks down to zero. And again, that, that obeys all the equations. So we've obeyed the boundary conditions. We've, we've got this one right, we've got this one right. Um, we've constructed, we've put these you know, different colors together, and it all makes sense. So if you're an engineer, um, for working purposes, this looks good enough, right? I mean, like, obeys the, bound, obeys the equations of the boundary conditions, so should be right if we can describe the natural world um, with mathematics. If you're a pure mathematician, you might sort of, mm, this sounds a little bit hand-waving with sort of do, doing tangents. Um, fundamentally, what this is, is that it is in fact the correct converged solution, but we know that physically, in reality, there's going to be some smearing of this front due to imbibition. You know, water is going to tend to imbibe ahead of the shock, okay, and then behind it's going a little bit slower. But when we consider that the, the capillary pressure is a small effect, that doesn't sort of dis break up the shock or destroy it, because you imagine that we now have this front moving along and there's a bit of capillary pressure, so it's a bit smeared out. Well, the water here, okay, has a lower saturation, that's a higher speed. So it would, it's lagging behind, but its natural speed is fast. So it sort of catches up with the front. This water that's imbibed ahead, so it's a low saturation, its natural speed, its DFDS is lower. So it finds its way ahead, but then it, sort of lagging behind a bit while everything else catches up. So it's what's called a self-sharpening wave or self-sharpening shock. It naturally will form a sharp change, right? It may be a change that varies over about, you know, the, what I'm showing with my hands, you know, half a meter, a meter or so, um, but it naturally does form. Now, you can think of drawing other shocks. You can try drawing shocks from one random place to another, but it never really ties in with the, with an, with the rarefaction. You could try doing a shock to a lower saturation, but then the rarefaction speed will be higher. So it goes out there and then goes back in. That doesn't make any sense. You could try a shock actually to a higher saturation, and that would be a slightly low, slower moving shock. And then there'll be a constant state like that. That sort of looks okay. But if you think about, again, a bit of capillary pressure, that breaks up because this region would want to move faster, right? And so, this region would sort of propagate beyond and the, and the front would actually be moving at a greater speed. So this is the solution. I will put in the final piece here, which is that uh, shock speed, right? So this is VDS, okay? And then in this region, right, we have VD is DFW by the step. Okay. So this is the um, Buckley-Leverett solution. Now, what it shows is it shows saturation as a function of this dimensionless velocity. And again, people don't like this, but it is a velocity. I mean, it's like driving a car. You know, in one hour, you do uh, 40 kilometers. In two hours, you can do 80 kilometers. All you need to know is the speed and then from the time you can work out where you are. So at any instant in time, so imagine you take a snapshot of the saturation. TD is a number. It's a number you know, you know the time, okay? Or in fact, in this case, how much water you've injected because you're the engineer, you drill the well, you designed how much water was going to be injected. So you know TD. Then XD is just this plot scaled with TD. So it has the same shape and you can actually put a number to it because there is a number here, all right? And if you do this, there are numbers. So you can actually calculate how far towards the production well have you moved, okay? So this is in fact a profile in terms of space as well as velocity. And the way of thinking about it, imagine this is the profile after five years. After 10 years, it's just moved twice as far every day. And so it's just a function of velocities, how much it moves per year. Okay. So um, that's the Buckley-Leverett solution. I'm going to leave, um, leave uh, that here and uh,
uh, conclude this section, there's still one thing we need to do is we've got the saturation profile inside the reservoir, and that, that's obviously very useful and interesting. Um, but from again, if we're looking from an engineering perspective, that's not really what I want to know. I want to know how much oil am I recovering? Okay? And we haven't, we haven't tackled that, but I haven't got room on the whiteboard because I want to show everything together. Um, we'll discuss that in a subsequent video. Okay, thank you very much.